us unto us. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon us and give us peace now and always. Amen. Proceedings are now resumed. You may be seated. Administration of oaths or affirmations? None. Reading by the Honorable Speaker of Messages and Announcements? None. Presentation of petitions? None. Presentation of papers and of reports? None. None. Questions to honorable ministers and members of the cabinet? None. Statements by honorable ministers and members of the cabinet? I've given leave to the Honorable Minister of Border Control and Labor to make a statement. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Madam Speaker, I would like to address the proposed amendments to the Cayman Islands National Pensions Act, which has been a subject of much discussion and deliberation in our community. As I said publicly, Madam Speaker, by way of the September 18th media release under the National Pensions Amendment Bill 2023, our mission is crystal clear. Empower every Caymanian to own a piece of land they call home. We recognize today's struggles, but with this amendment, we're paving a pathway for our people to pay off or reduce their mortgages or purchase or build homes. I have always been and will always be about helping our people. This government is unwavering in its commitment to ensure that every Caymanian has a brighter, more secure future. Based on the appeals that have been made to me, I know that Caymanians are hurting and are most keen on these pension withdrawals. But let me be clear from the outset, the proposed Pension withdrawals are not, I repeat, not emergency withdrawals for immediate cash in hand. Instead, these are strategic withdrawals aimed at specific life milestones. These include facilitating Caymanians in paying off their mortgages, making down payments, and purchasing land. These are significant financial commitments, and by allowing such, such withdrawals, we aim to empower citizens to make decisions that are in the best interest of their long-term financial health. 
However, these provisions come with a set of well-thought-out checks and balances in most cases. The withdrawals must be repaid through increased contributions. The amendments ensure that citizens can access funds when needed and remain committed to their long-term financial well-being and retirement planning. To further strengthen this commitment, our bill contains additional safeguards to ensure these withdrawals are repaid. The amendments are not just a short-term relief measure, it's a restructuring of how our pensions regime can serve the broader needs of our citizens while ensuring the systems remain robust. We remain committed to preserving the integrity of our pension system so that each person can live out their golden age in dignity. Another significant point of clarity that is necessary is that the proposed amendments do not apply to the public sector pensions plan, parliamentary and the judicial pension plans. These plans are mostly administered by the Public Service Pension Board and are governed by different laws, which are not in my area of constitutional responsibility as minister. We earnestly look forward to the support of Parliament in passing this bill. It was passed. Its successful passage will not only address the immediate concerns, which was, still it will pave the way for a more holistic review of our pension system. In that light, I'm pleased to announce that the Depart of Department of Labor and Pensions is commissioning an actuarial study of all private sector pension plans. The actuarial study is a significant step in understanding our pensions landscape, health, challenges, and opportunities. Once the results of this actuarial study are in hand, the National Pensions Board and the Department of Labor and Pensions will collaborate to make recommendations to refine our pension investments regulations further. Madam Speaker, once the actuarial study results are in, it is essential for this House to convene the select committee of the whole House on Pensions. One of the things we must consider was raised by the member from Bodentown West, which is increasing the pension contribution rates from the current 10%. Increasing the contribution rate offers numerous long-term advantages. It ensures a larger <coughs> retirement account for each pensioner, accommodating longer lifespans and providing retirees financial security. <laughs> Reducing dependency in government welfare, which means less financial burdens on our future generation. Furthermore, a well-funded pension system can better manage invest investment risk, benefit from compound interests, and invest in our diverse portfolios for higher returns. This approach promotes social cohesion, encourages formal employment, and instills a savings culture. However, the potential challenges of reduced take-home salaries and increased employer costs must be weighed against these benefits. Addressing the broader, broader social economic perspective, Many of our fellow Caymanians are grappling with financial challenges, some even approaching the poverty line. Rest assured, Madam Speaker, we have and will continue to de devise other interventions to assist them. In addition to these amendments, I, offer, I want to offer some more general financial advice to help bring long-term relief let us adopt more prudence in our financial decisions. Let us only purchase what we need, not necessarily what we want. Let us choose what is essential rather than what is excessive or extravagant, especially on major purchases such as homes and cars. We can also forego that long vacation in favor of a shorter one. 
Every dollar saved today will compound to ensure a comfortable future. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, I urge employers and employees to shop for pension plan providers. It's a competitive market out there. Look for pension plan providers with low administrative fees and decent returns on their pension investments. Consolidation can also be a smart move. If you have multiple pension plans, particularly with providers who charge larger administrative fees, consider consolidating them under one provider. These steps can lead to significant savings in the long run. In conclusion, Madam Speaker, our pension system is a bedrock of financial stability for our retirees and by extension our country. The proposed amendments are a testament to our commitment to evolve, adapt, and ensure it continues to serve the best interests of all Caymanians today and in the future. I thank you, Madam Speaker. I've given leave to the Honorable Deputy Premier to make a statement. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, as required by Section 11.6 of the Public Management and Finance Act 2020 Revision, I make this statement to the members of this Honorable House with respect to exceptional circumstances that Cabinet approved for the Minister of Education for the period 1 January to 15th of September 2023. Such transactions were approved pursuant to Section 11.5 of the PMFA. The statement provides details of the aforementioned transactions, EGA 1 policy advice, governance, and ministerial support services. Madam Speaker, the Education Regulations 2017 requires that all staff and volunteers in public and private educational institutions complete the child protection safeguarding training. Since 2021, the Minister of Education developed a training program specifically for the Cayman Islands. The training has an online module and an in-person workshop. To date, over 2,700 persons have completed this training administered by our inclusion unit team. In order to enhance the online module, the team has decided to have the module professionally animated, narrated. The cost was $10,000. Approval is being sought under Section 11.5 of the PMFA 2020 revision to increase EGA1 policy advice governance and ministerial support services by the $10,000 and concurrently decreasing NGS79, Cayman Islands Protective Services, K9 services by the said $10,000. EGA5, primary education. Madam Speaker, with my team, Review the results of key stage two standard assessment tests that were administered in May of last year. It was duly noted that only 27% of year six students received the expected level of reading, writing, and mathematics. A number of strategies were developed and a roadmap was defined with the aim of improving overall student outcomes. One strategy, Madam Speaker, was the implementation of a summer school program to support year six students transitioning from primary schools to year seven in our secondary schools. The cost of running the summer school program in the selected primary schools on Grand Cayman and in Cayman Brack was $125,650. Therefore, approval is required under Section 11.5 of the PMFA 2020 revision to increase EGA 5 primary education by 125,650 and thereby decreasing NGS 691 public school meals by the said 125,650. 
EGA 6 secondary education. Madam Speaker, this year, the registration levels for transfer and new students were 15% above the average of the previous four years. In order for our secondary schools to accommodate this increase, additional resources in terms of staff and educational materials were required. Staffing was anticipated to cost 1.9 million and educational material 100 grand. Therefore, approval is being sought under the PMFA 2020 revision to increase EGS 6 secondary education by $2 million, thereby decreasing um, the wider CI budget under the 11.5. The rising cost of fuel, Madam Speaker, have also affected the utility charges for this appropriation, and as such, the funding originally budgeted was deemed not adequate to cover the cost for the year. As an interim measure, in August 2023, the Cabinet approved $500,000 to be reallocated to fully, to cover, I beg your pardon, the utility bills for that month. It is anticipated that additional funding will be required to cover the charges for the remainder of the year. Therefore, the approval is being required under Section 11.5 of the PMFA 2020 revision to increase EGS 6 secondary schools by 500,000, thereby decreasing TP93 public school grants and COVID-19 recovery program by the said 500,000. EGA 10, Education for Early Childhood and Support Services. Madam Speaker, we realized that there was no early provision in the Eastern districts being Northside and Easton. This service is normally contained in a nursery class or an early childhood center. In January of this year, the leadership at the Easton Primary School expressed a willingness to adjust the usage of one section of the institution to facilitate a nursery provision. The cost of teachers, care workers, and educational materials was 81697 Approval is therefore being sought via Section 11.5 of the PMFA 2020 revision to increase EGA 10 education, early childhood, and support services by 81697 and decrease EGA 1 policy advice, governance, and ministerial support services by the said 801,697. TP30, local and overseas scholarship and bursaries. Madam Speaker, funding gaps were identified in order to cover the cost for fall 2023 semester. The total projected cost for scholarship related activities in 2020 fiscal year was 25,150,162. This resulted in a funding deficit of 15 million 150 162 for 2023 fiscal year. To commence disbursement in August as is customary, an initial top up of 4 million was approved by cabinet. Therefore, approval is now being sought via section 11.5 of the PMFA 2020 revision to increase TP30 local and overseas scholarships and bursaries by $4 million. Decrease NGS 91 public school meals programs by $3 million. Decrease TP 83 scholarships medical by $770,000. Decrease TP 93 public school grants and COVID-19 recovery program by $230,000. The funds that were reallocated, Madam Speaker, quickly ran out and a further $4 million was requested and approved by Cabinet in the first week of September. Therefore, approval is now being sought via Section 11.5 of the PMFA 2020 revision to increase TB30 scholarships, local and overseas, bursaries by $4 million. The decrease was taken from the general CIG budget for 2023. CC01, Teaching of Tertiary Level Professional and Vocational Programs. Madam Speaker, the Board of Governors for the UCCI, University College of the Cayman Islands, has various operational functions as a part of its remit under the law. In line with the fees provided to the board members of other statutory authorities, 
and December of 2021, the board fees were increased. The increase was not included in the allocation for UCCI 2022-2023 budget periods. The additional cost to meet the increased fees paid to the Board of Governors at UCCI were $199,236. Approval is now being sought via Section 11.5 of the PMFA 2020 revision to increase CC01 teaching of tertiary level professional and vocational programs by 196236 and thereby decreasing TP93 public school grants and COVID-19 recovery program by the said sum of 199236. TP51, other educational and training assistance. Madam Speaker, the Triple C School has been undergoing some serious financial challenges, which were brought about by a number of factors. These include, but are not limited to, giving all parents a reduction of fees between 10 and 30% during 2020, the COVID period, as well as a further compassionate payment discount for struggling parents. Loss of school fee income due to students leaving the island during the COVID-19 pandemic. Loss of school fee income due to students leaving the school because of weak inspection grading from the OES, that's the Office of Educational Standards. Cost to be incurred by an enactment of Section 19 of the Education Act due to consecutive weak inspections from the OES. Unexpected capital costs. Although, Madam Speaker, the school will be increasing tuition and other fees, there is still a significant shortfall in order to continue the Triple C school operation. Due to the extenuating circumstances that Triple C school found itself in, and considering the social impact on the families served by this important school, it is befitting to assist in whatever way that the government could. The assistance was in the form of a one-time grant of $383,518. Therefore, Madam Speaker, this approval was given via Section 11.5 of the PMFA 2020 revision by increasing TP51, other educational and training assistance, by 383518, and a decrease was taken from the wider CIG budget for 2023. EI 12, Ministry of Education. Madam Speaker, in order to achieve better outcomes for children with autism spectrum disorder, we thought it beneficial to establish a KS1 autism spectrum class at the Sir John A. Cumber Primary School. This was done with a view of broadening the educational experience of these students in mainstream school while in a class of their own community. Approval is therefore being sought, Madam Speaker, under Section 11.5 of the PMFA 2020 revision to increase EI 12, Minister of Education, by 27,000, decrease NGS 91, Public School Meals Program, by the said 27,000. The Edna Mall Primary School is, its, is in its initial stages of planning and early fees are required to be paid. This project was not an approved project under the 2022-2023 budget for the Ministry of Education, and as such, there was no funding available for the payments required, which amounted to $50,000. Approval has been sought under Section 11.5 of the PMFA 2020 revision to increase EI-12 Ministry of Education by $50,000 and thereby decreasing EI-1161, the submarine cable, by $50,000. In addition, Madam Speaker, as mentioned earlier, with the provision of early air services in the Eastern District of Northside and Easton, there was also a need to renovate and repurpose the available space at the Easton Primary School. This was estimated to cost $163,360. Approval is hereby being sought by virtue of Section 11.5 of the PMFA 2020 revision to increase EI 12, 
Minister of Education by 163,000, decreased NGS 91 public school meals program by the said 163,300. In conclusion, Madam Speaker, I thank you for allowing me to explain the various exceptional circumstances that have resulted in the supplementary appropriations being requested by the Ministry of Education for the period of 1 January 15 to September 2020. I wish to thank my colleagues for their support and the Ministry's staff and department for their technical expertise and advice accordingly. I also have a statement that you've given permission for for Dal. Thank you once again, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I continue by indicating that I wish to thank you again for this opportunity and for your indulgence for allowing me to make this statement as required under the PMFA as it relates to my other minister, the Minister of District Administration and Lands for 2023 to date. Madam Speaker, Cabinet was asked to consider and approve the following request for Section 11.5 appropriations in accordance with the Public Management Finance Act 2020 revision by the Ministry of District Administration and Lands in order to satisfy the expenditure needs as follows. Land acquisition. Madam Speaker, Cabinet approved the increase to EA4 land acquisitions in the Ministry of District Administration and lands by $1,805,000 to facilitate the acquisition of various properties for public use via transfers between appropriation in accordance with 11.5 of the PMFA Act 2020 revision. The aforementioned amount of $1,805,000 is comprised of a decrease of $285,000 of EI87 equity injection, the Ministry of Dal, a decrease of 420,000 EA161, Ministry of Planning, Housing and Infrastructure, a decrease of 1,100,000 to EA161, the Ministry of Planning, Agriculture, House and Infrastructure, the Sister Islands Beaches and Community Cleanup Program. Madam Speaker, the Sister Island Beaches Community Cleanup Program engages unemployed Cayman Brack and Little Cayman residents, with a few from Grand Cayman, with gainful and meaningful employment to maintain the beauty and the um, pristine nature of the sister islands. This program is vital as it allows unemployed Caymanians in the sister islands to obtain gainful occupation while also undertaking the vital task of a full work week. 3000 $300,000 was approved by cabinet via section 115 of the PMFA Act 2020 revision for this purpose. Madam Speaker, I thank you for allowing me to explain this exceptional circumstance which has resulted in the supplementary appropriations initiated by the Dal Ministry by virtue of 115 of the PMFA Act 2020. Those are my submissions as it relates to the 11 fives. Thank you. Elected member for West Bay West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, in accordance with Standing Order 30 and Suborder 2, I crave your indulgence to ask a short question in relation to the first statement by the Honorable Minister. So ordered. Madam. Madam Speaker, I wonder if the Minister could say what is happening with the requests we have made in regards to the Wesleyan Christian Academy. I think what was education and Madam Speaker, we made a request, and the needs, Madam Speaker, are not much different from the needs that the Triple C School has and is experiencing. And there was a first part of the grant 
which was 60,000. And so I'm asking, and I have asked for the other $60,000, and I'm wondering where and when that would be attended to. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thanks to the Honorable Member from West Bay West. As he indicated, um, a request, to the best of my knowledge, came into the ministry for $60,000, which we fulfill that request. I believe I'm correct in saying that there was an additional 60000 When that reaches my attention, I would follow the normal procedure where I would prepare a draft caucus paper, um, seek to get the green light of caucus. If that is given, take it to cabinet, either by a section 11.5 or a section 12. Um, looking in our budget, see whether we had it. If not, go for a straightforward 11.5 or 12. Subject to the support of colleagues, of course. Honorable members, I have also given leave to the Honorable Premier to make a statement. Madam Speaker, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to make this statement this morning to this Honorable House. Madam Speaker, I rise to discuss a real and heavy burden on the shoulders of many Caymanian families today. Some of this, Madam Speaker, we have heard through discussions on other matters this week. Madam Speaker, I'm talking about their inability to purchase a home in their own country. Madam Speaker, as a member of Parliament and Premier, I hear their stories every day. Now, while each story is unique and each family is different, they all share a single common struggle. Lately, it seems almost impossible for the average Caymanian to buy property for themselves or their families to call home. For some Caymanians, it feels next to impossible to buy a piece of land for themselves or to leave it for the next generation. Madam Speaker, in Cayman's boom years in the 1980s and 1990s, the parents of many of today's young adults were able to purchase, or if they were lucky, to inherit land and build their own version of the Caymanian dream as a standalone concrete block home. But time moved on, Madam Speaker, and as Cayman's economy continued to grow and flourish, real estate prices in our country continued to rise. Real estate development, marketing, and sales became its own booming industry. And while this has had a positive impact on the value of property in the Cayman Islands and for many Caymanians, it had the punitive effect of placing home ownership further beyond the reach of many young Caymanians. Eventually, the government of the day had the prudence to introduce a stamp duty exemption for first time Caymanian home buyers. This single action, Madam Speaker, paved the way for many more Caymanians to afford to take their first steps on the property ladder. Over time, the thresholds for these stamp duty exemptions were tweaked and adjusted to accommodate inflation and steadily rising uh, real estate prices. However, Madam Speaker, since 2020, 
real estate prices across our islands have seen dramatic increases coupled with rising calls from the wider public for more generous stamp duty concessions for first time Caymanian buyers to make it possible for Caymanians to afford a place of their own, a place to call home. This challenge, Madam Speaker, that we face is ironically a consequence of galloping unmanaged growth. As our economy and population grew, the demands for housing grew along with it. Look around, Madam Speaker, we all see it. Houses and properties and the, in the lower to middle price range are be, being snapped up quicker than you can blink. And if we're being honest, Madam Speaker, and we must be honest, the, with the heightened interest in higher priced properties by largely foreign buyers, many of whom see the excellent investment opportunity of buying property in a country where you pay stamp duty once, and that is it, where there's no annual property tax, no capital gains tax, no income tax, it means that most of the newly built properties are priced far, far beyond the reach of lower to middle income Caymanian families. Madam Speaker, with the increasing cost of borrowing and the inflation on cost of goods since the pandemic and the geopolitical issues we had in early 22, the costs to property developers have also gone up, leading again to higher prices. If you are a Caymanian couple or a single young professional hoping to buy property, it seems as if there's hardly anything you can afford. This leads, Madam Speaker, to despair. These obstacles diminish the hopes of our people they shatter the Caymanian dreams. Consider the plight of single income, income families, of which there are many in our communities. A middle-aged single mother of three beautiful children told me how she started trying to save for a down payment for a property, for a home for her family. Most banks and lending institutions Nowadays, want a down payment of 20% for a mortgage. And with two boys and one girl on her way to becoming a teenager, this single mother needs a three-bedroom property to comfortably shelter her family. Prices for modest three-bedroom home, homes in the Eastern Districts have been steadily rising for years. Today, we're lucky if you can manage to find a home in the $485,000 to $500,000 range. And that's at the lower end of the spectrum, Madam Speaker. Even at that price range, a single mother would still need a 20% down payment of $97,000 to access a mortgage. That is, if her income, age, and debt ratio allow her to qualify for that amount in the first place. Madam Speaker, all of us in this house can grasp the magnitude of the, the task trying to save nearly $100,000 for a down payment. Can you imagine how hard it is, Madam Speaker, to find that amount of money as a single mother with young, three young children on her own? And even if she managed, Madam Speaker, to scratch scrabble together the money for the down payment. Who is going to help her come up with even more money to pay the thousands of dollars on the stamp duty? Madam Speaker, we intend to help that young mother. This government will, Madam Speaker. We have and we will. Madam Speaker, on the 18th of September, of 2023. Cabinet approved a paper prepared by the Ministry of Finance and Economic De Development for drafting instructions to revise the current stamp duty concessions for prospective Caymanian homeowners. By increasing the property values 
eligible for a full waiver of stamp duty. These amendments, Madam Speaker, will help prospective Caymanian homeowners by one, increasing the value of property prices eligible for a full waiver of stamp duty for first-time Caymanian buyers, two, introducing a new tier of stamp duty con concessions for Caymanians purchasing their second properties and by way of amendments to the Stamp Duty Act to seek to enshrine both types of, uh, uh, both of these concessions in law, thereby providing Caymanians with the certainty they need in order to plan for their future. For clarity, Madam Speaker, I'll outline the new Stamp Duty waiver and, and discount regime for first and second time Caymanian buyers. Madam Speaker, for Caymanian purchasing their first parcel of raw land, there will be no stamp duty assessed on values up to $250,000. Where the property value is above $250,000 but less than $350,000, stamp duty will be assessed at 3.75% on the difference above the $250,000 only. For Caymanian purchasing their first home or developed residential property, there will be no stamp duty assessed on values up to CI $550,000. Where the property value is above $550,000 but less than $650,000, stamp duty will be assessed at 3.75% on the difference above the $550,000 only. Madam Speaker, for a group of between 2 and 10 Caymanians purchasing their first parcel of raw land together, there will be no stamp duty assessed on values up to CI $450,000. Where the property value is above $450,000 but less than $550,000, stamp duty will be assessed at 3.75%. That is on the difference only above the 450000 For a group of 2 to 10 Caymanians purchasing their first home or developed residential property together, there will be no stamp duty assessed on values up to CI $600,000. Where the property value is above $600,000 but less than $700,000, stamp duty will be assessed at 3.75% on the difference above the 600,000 only. Madam Speaker, the changes also formalize an avenue for Caymanians purchasing their second property to qualify for a discounted stamp duty rate to be assessed. For a Caymanian purchasing a second parcel of raw land, stamp duty will be assessed at 3.75% on values up to $300,000. For a Caymanian purchasing their second home or developed residential property, stamp duty will be assessed at 3.75% on values up to $600,000. For a group of two to 10 Caymanians purchasing a second parcel of raw land together Stamp duty will be assessed at 3.75% on values up to $550,000. For a group of 2 to 10 Caymanians purchasing a second home or developed residential property together, stamp duty will be assessed at 3.75% on values up to $700,000. In real terms, Madam Speaker, these revised concessions will provide significant financial relief to Caymanians who are purchasing homes or land. A young couple, Madam Speaker, purchasing their first home for CI $600,000 would normally have to pay $45,000 in stamp duty. This revised concession saves almost all of that $45,000 
which they can use to help provide for their children's education or save for their own retirement. With the concession, Madam Speaker, that young couple can pay stamp duty at the reduced rate of 3.75% on the 50,000 difference between the upper limit of the zero stamp duty property value and the purchase price. That stamp duty, Madam Speaker, would amount to $1,875. So we will save that young family $43,125. A single person, Madam Speaker, purchasing a lot of raw land for CI $175,000 will therefore be able to keep $13,125 in their pocket as a result of this concession structure. Without this concession, Madam Speaker, they'd have to pay that $13,125. With it, they pay, that single Caymanian man or woman pays nothing. Madam Speaker, that husband and wife with children and another baby on the way who are trying to purchase a larger property at a cost of CI 700,000 for their growing family will save $48,700. Without these concessions, Madam Speaker, the stamp duty payable on their $700,000 second property would be 50, CI 52,500. With these concessions, the stamp duty they have to pay is significantly reduced to only $3,750. Madam Speaker, that is a very significant savings without which they may well not have been able to purchase that larger home. Madam Speaker, a group of, further, a group of two to 10 Caymanians were pooling together to purchase an investment property or their second property for uh, CI 700,000 will save CI $26,250 with these proposed new uh, concession enhancements. Without them, the stamp duty payable would be $52,500. So they're all, they will only end up paying in stamp duty CI $26,250. Madam Speaker, this is very welcome news for that young single mother with the three children that I mentioned earlier. And if she hasn't heard it, I can't wait to be able to tell her about the benefits she'll be able to get. Under this new proposal, Madam Speaker, she qualifies for a full waiver of duty on her new home that she'd be seeking at current values, Madam Speaker. Under the proposed enhancements, one Caymanian buyer purchasing their first property with a value up to 550000 does not have to pay stamp duty on that property at all. That's right, Madam Speaker, zero. That translates into thousands of dollars, real benefits for that mother and her children. Thousands of dollars that they can use to otherwise improve their quality of life. Madam Speaker, in order to bring these enhanced stamp duty benefits to Caymanians immediately, in my capacity as Commissioner for, for Stamp Duty, um, I will exercise the powers under Section 26A of the Stamp Duty Act, 2019 revision, to implement or grant this important stamp, stamp duty relief to Caymanians. The process for the legislative um, amendments is a thorough but lengthy one, but when completed, will ensure that these valuable benefits are available for all Caymanians purchasing their first or second properties without being subject to the discretion of anyone, without having to wait a period of time and ensure that they have all of, their, all of the required documentation in place. Madam Speaker, these stamp duty concessions 
will increase the, the number of Caymanians who are able to afford their first or second homes and make it easier for hardworking Caymanian families to be able to purchase property and to own their own homes. These concessions will similarly increase the number of Caymanians who can afford to buy raw land or build on, their own, build to, on which to build their own home or just hold it for the future, hold it for their children. Madam Speaker, we all understand that home ownership is such a critical component in quality of life, financial security, and generating, or creating, I should say, generational wealth. It will un undoubtedly bring far greater peace of mind to many Caymanians thinking about their own future as well as that of their children and grandchildren. Madam Speaker, I'd like to give some background and context to these important changes in stamp duty concessions. Since taking office, Madam Speaker, this government has had one guiding principle at the forefront of what we do, that is to improve the quality of life for our people. I, as I mentioned at the start of this statement, all of us, all members of Parliament have heard the people's concerns and woes regarding housing and property ownership. It has taken much of our discussions in the past couple of days. Madam Speaker, from the very start of our administration, we've made it a point to do as much as we can do to alleviate these pressures and concerns. In March of 2022, this government created an interministerial task force to assess and address the housing issue in the Cayman Islands. We also made it a priority to grant what we determined were valid applications for discretionary stamp duty waivers that were primarily from Caymanians purchasing property outside of the current concession thresholds. Madam Speaker, if we, if we look at the discretionary stamp duty abatements granted under Section 26A of the Stamp Duty Act, we see that in 2020 the total amount waived was just under CI 346,613. But in 2021, the total amount waived was CI $1,603,016. A Madam Speaker, in 2022, the total amount waived by discretionary approvals was CI $2,900,367. Madam Speaker, these amounts clearly show that as we looked at this issue and worked on reforming the relevant policies and legislation, we were certainly not idle. We were pro proactively alleviating the problem as best as we could within the existing parameters. So, Madam Speaker, when this issue was brought to this Honorable House and dealt with through private member motion number four on the 9th of June, 2022, it was passed unanimously. We all supported and understood the issues. We were doing much of this ourselves already, but there is clear merit and there's clear justification and reason, particularly around certainty and speed, Madam Speaker, in having these amendments in the Stamp Duty Act. Madam Speaker, this government has since continued its work to provide produce a broader, more inclusive policy mechanism to help Caymanian homebuyers get a leg up in the real estate ladder and provide for their families. Indeed, Madam Speaker, we were focused on creating a scheme that directly addresses the challenges of Caymanian property buyers that includes more Caymanians in the spectrum of offered concessions. And while, Madam Speaker, that work was being done, that broadening, that refining, that polishing, Madam Speaker, this government did not sit idly by. But instead, we continued the work of the Housing Task Force and continued continue to assess and grant 
deserving discretionary applications for exemption beyond the existing thresholds. While we polished and expanded the proposed stamp duty concessions, while we made sure it included as many Caymanians as possible, we were still working to solve the overall problem and to give as much relief as we could within the existing parameters. Because, Madam Speaker, we see and understand the need and demand for this program right now in September 23 through a year to date statistics. As at August, 31st August 2023, there have been 97 applications approved under the current concession for Caymanians purchasing their first properties, providing receipts, or recipients rather of, with, with CI 1.72 million in stamp duty relief, a further 53 applicants have been granted discretionary waivers of stamp duty on the purchase of properties uh, with those waivers totaling CI 1 million, sorry, 1.16 million. Madam Speaker, as I mentioned multiple times in this city, in July of this year, the technical working group of the Interministerial Housing Task Force presented its recommendations to solve the intricate and multifaceted housing um, crisis related issues that Caymanians have been dealing with. This technical working group recommended that the ta to the task force that we continue but increase the value of properties eligible for stamp duty waivers or reductions. And their recommendation and their conclusion, Madam Speaker, that this was that this was one of the fastest ways that we could utilize to help eligible Caymanians afford their first property. This proposal, Madam Speaker, that I have outlined to you and to this Honorable House has been doing that and, and intends to continue to do precisely that and more. And there were more announcements, or there will be more announcements to come, Madam Speaker, as we continue to implement the task force um, recommendations. Rest assured, Madam Speaker, that today's proposal is just one step. We had the discussion yesterday and discussed other steps, including the proposed resuscitation of the GG Ham uh, initiative. This is just one step in this ongoing holistic approach to help us get closer to solving what social scientists refer to as a wicked problem. That is the problem of housing affordability in our beautiful Cayman Islands for our wonderful people. In fact, Madam Speaker, this government recognizes home ownership as such a vital issue that we included it in our strategic policy statement presented in April of this year. We included a commitment by this government to provide affordable housing and to create new opportunities for Caymanians to access capital for home ownership. Today, Madam Speaker, in outlining this, we've taken another step forward in fulfilling outcome number three of our strategic policy statement in which we commit this government to seeking solutions to improve the well-being of our people and to help them and their families reach their fullest potential. Today, Madam Speaker, in this proposal, we demonstrate our commitment to enabling wealth generation through home ownership. This government, Madam Speaker, realizes that access to affordable, stable housing is essential to the health of the people and families across this country. The fact of the matter is, when our people don't have access to stable, affordable housing, they are unable to fully participate in the development of this country and their communities. So, Madam Speaker, we owe it to our people and to future generations to create access to affordable, stable, and sustainable housing for all Caymanian families. We know that, like the single mother I mentioned 
earlier, at the start of my presentation, far too many Caymanians are struggling to find affordable homes that meet their needs and the needs of their families. The truth is, Madam Speaker, when the cost to keep a roof over your head becomes too high, it limits the ability of our people to spend on other things they need to improve their quality of life. Not having access to affordable housing is a burden on the quality of life of our people and families. Meanwhile, Madam Speaker, our population, as we noted previously, continues to grow. Recent findings from the Cayman Islands Labor Force Survey Spring 2023 report tells us that the country's overall population increased by 6.5% in the past year to reach 83,671 as of June 2023. Housing in the context of a growing population is a challenge that we must continually tend to and address. There is no magic wand to fix this, Madam Speaker. It requires ongoing, painstaking attention to detail and updated data on housing trends and costs in our country. But it must be done. From the very beginning, Madam Speaker, this government has always recognized the vital importance of housing and home ownership in improving the well-being of our Caymanian families. We are also improving the application process for first and second time Caymanian property buyers. The Ministry of Finance and Economic Development will have a dedicated team processing the applications electronically, allowing for the issuance of decisions within five to seven days of receipt of a completed application. It's important, Madam Speaker, to have speed in delivering these decisions because our Caymanians are competing in a very active marketplace for properties that they can lose very easily. Once the amendments to the Stamp Duty Act, Madam Speaker, are brought to this Honourable House and hopefully adopted, the applications will be processed administratively, removing the need for the Minister to be involved in the approval of each application. Looking forward, we intend to further improve processing by use of an online portal which will allow applicants to submit and track their applications and receive approvals via the online internet, um, online portal. Madam Speaker, so we're working hard not only to expand the concessions, to include more Caymanian buyers, to include the higher range of values reflecting the, the market, but we're making it easier and faster to be able to access this. This, Madam Speaker, is another one of our broad outcomes, modernizing government. Now, let me be abundantly clear, Madam Speaker, this is just one step that must be taken. There are more things to do to solve this problem. Some have been discussed, some we, are, we, we will be rolling out further on behalf of the Caymanian people and their families. But I think I want members and I want the public to know this. These enhanced concessions for Caymanians who dream of owning a home, who dream of having a place to call their own, a place that shelters and protects them and their family, these Caymanians will be directly benefited by the recommendations that we table here today. We're fully aware, Madam Speaker, that we're living in an unprecedented time, unprecedented time of high interest rate and high cost of living. We're also aware that since these are the result of global shocks and disruptions, there's not a lot we can do except to help our people to weather the storm and provide the alleviation where we can. However, Madam Speaker, we believe by, that by enshrining these increased concessions for Caymanians in law, we can provide greater protections from future economic shocks, give our Caymanian people, prospective Caymanian buyers, and prospective lenders the certainty needed to help Caymanians in this competitive market. Housing is one of those key areas, Madam Speaker, where we must invest to 
produce the most positive impact and to build a stronger and more secure economy for the people and families of the Cayman Islands. And yes, we can do this while continuing to be fiscally prudent and responsible. For those who are concerned about the financial implications, we do not expect there to be any material negative impact on the government's financial position. In addition, the benefits which accrue to Caymanian families in the greater economy from increased home and property ownership will have longer term uh, positive impacts for us all. Madam Speaker, there are many factors which drive the demand for property purchases and requests for these concessions. These include the purchasing power of Caymanian buyers, market prices, available inventory, mortgage interest rates, and the availability of financing. All of these, Madam Speaker, we seek to be addressing through recommendations and implementing, implementation of those from the Housing Task Force. Madam Speaker, in the, New, in the New Testament, the Bible instructs us to never become weary in doing good. I know that doing good and doing what we can do to make home, home ownership available and affordable for Caymanians does good for all Caymanians and their families in this country. Madam Speaker, this government listens to the people bit by bit, step by step, we find solutions to help Caymanians solve their problems. On behalf of every Caymanian, dreaming of owning a house, owning a piece of land, on behalf of that hard-working single mother and her children, and so many others, Madam Speaker, I ask everyone in this Honorable House to join us, join me in supporting this new stamp duty regime for first and second time Caymanian buyers, particularly when the, bill, the amendment bill is brought, Madam Speaker. But in the meantime, those benefits will be available to our people. I thank you very much. I have given leave to the Honorable Health Minister of Health and Wellness to make a statement. Yeah. <laughs> right, since you're here. Good night. Good you. <laughs> you can, I won't. Just, just push it. Okay. Thank you. Madam Speaker, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to bring to the attention of this Honourable Parliament the details of appropriation changes approved by Cabinet for the Ministry of Home Affairs in accordance with Section 11.5 of the Public Management and Finance Act 2020. Madam Speaker, I would like to report on the following approval made by Cabinet. Uh, supplementary funding for the Cayman Islands Fire Service in 2023. However, I humbly seek your indulgence to say a special thank you to the firefighters who responded to a destructive structural fire at a home in Windsor Park around five o'clock this morning. Thank God the seven occupants um, are safe. And Madam Speaker, it's another example of selfless act of emergency response being delivered by our very own Cayman Islands Fire Service officers, and I want to publicly thank them for their service. Madam Speaker, Cabinet approved supplementary funding pursuant to the Public Management and Finance Act 2020 revision, Section 11.5, in the 2023 operational appropriations to the Cayman Islands Fire Service by increasing output group HAF-5 domestic airdrome fire services in the amount of 
This is this approval was for supplementary funding in accordance with the 11.5 of the PMFA and meets expenses incurred as a result of critical and necessary recruitments and promotions of the Cayman Islands Fire Service personnel. Madam Speaker, the Fire Service provides 24-hour emergency fire and rescue services, as well as domestic operational response 365 days a year to the Cayman Islands. The strategic priority of the Fire Service is to build and maintain necessary capacity, as well as capability to ensure safe, efficient, and professional response to a broad range of fire rescue services. In line with this priority, Madam Speaker, the Fire Service successfully identified 22 Caymanian trainee firefighters during this annual recruitment drive in 2022. However, in the current 2023-2024 budget allocations, the Fire Service was unable to complete the hiring process due to a lack of funding for new posts. Madam Speaker, consequently, the Fire Service has continued to operate into the current year with a deficit of, of approximately 30 firefighters, which is compounding particular risks to firefighter safety, health and wellness, emergency response effectiveness, overtime costs, and career promotion opportunities for Caymanians. Firefighters represent the largest group of personnel being utilized on overtime basis, with approximately $357,591 in overtime costs accumulated as of April 2023. Moreover, Madam Speaker, the demand for fire rescue services is anticipated to increase especially considering the current environmental context, expanding infrastructure, and increasing population of the Cayman Islands. In order to maintain its capacity in these exceptional circumstances, the fire service critically needed the requested funding to complete the recruitment of the additional personnel. Therefore, Madam Speaker, recruiting the 22 additional firefighters will not only drastically improve operational firefighting and rescue capacity, but also significantly address the organization's resilience on overtime as the continuous operational demand for fire rescue services combined with the current staffing deficit has resulted in high overtime costs. In addition, Madam Speaker, another key strategic priority for a fire service relates to ensuring succession planning for our firefighters so as to continually professionalize and build excellence across the entire organization. Therefore, the fire service identified 21 Caymanian firefighters suitably experienced and qualified for promotion to the rank of sub officer. However, the existing budget was unable to facilitate these critical promotions, thereby limiting development and stability of the fire service, as well as opportunities for Caymanian advancement throughout the organization. Madam Speaker, considering the context of the Cayman Islands environment and the increasingly unpredictable demand for services, there has been an over-reliance on firefighters to serve on an overtime basis or in acting capacities for extended periods of time at all levels of the organization. As such, Madam Speaker, in these exceptional circumstances, Cabinet approved the supplementary funded as required to ensure the fire service is able to meet the expenses associated with necessary recruitment and promotions needed to continue providing 24-hour emergency coverage. 
As previously stated, Madam Speaker, this request was made and approved pursuant to Section 11.5 of the Public Management and Finance Act 2020. Madam Speaker, I would again like to thank you for this opportunity to report on the following approval made by Cabinet for supplementary funding of the Cayman Islands Regiment in 2023. Madam Speaker, Cabinet approves supplementary funding pursuant to the Public Management and Finance Act 2020 revision for um, revision in the 2023 operational appropriations to the Cayman Islands Regiment by increasing output group HAF 06, Cayman Islands Regiment in the amount of $809,846. This approval was for supplementary funding in accordance with Section 11.5 of the PMFA to meet the expenses incurred as a result of operational expenditure. This was to increase HAF 6, Cayman Islands Regiment, in the amount of $809,846. Madam Speaker, members will recall that in October of 2019, the government, in conjunction with his, with his Excellency the Governor at the time, announced a policy to form a regiment for the Cayman Islands. Notably, this policy continues to be supported by Her Excellency the Governor and the current administration. Madam Speaker, since its formula, formation in October of 2019, the Cayman Islands Regiment has become an essential part of public safety and national security in times of emergency, disaster, and crisis. As required for delivery of the government's policy for its continued strategic development, supplementary funding was requested to continue to build capacity and capability within the regiment to advance the country's national resilience. Madam Speaker, the regiment has seen an increase in demand for service in the last few years, including the delivery of critical operational support to the police service, fire service, prison service, Coast Guard, and Customs and Border Control, amongst others. For example, Madam Speaker, the regiment has been called upon to provide necessary support to CBC in managing the national humanitarian crisis of immigrants arriving from Cuba. Moreover, the regiment has also call, been called on to deliver critical operational support in response to that serious propane gas explosion in the residential neighborhood of Newlands. The regiment is also a key component of the National Emergency Operations Center, as we know as NEOC, providing disaster response services before during and after natural disasters. As such, Madam Speaker, although it is difficult to predict the diverse threats and risks that arise suddenly across our communities, such increases in operational support activity and the delivery of government's policy to grow the regiment requires continued investment in personnel, specialist training, and development services. Madam Speaker, in these exceptional circumstances, the regiment critically needed funding to support continuity of existing full-time staff, specialized training, operation deployment costs, supplies and consumables, lease and other operational expenses in order to carry out its remit of strengthening the resilience of the Cayman Islands during times of crisis. As previously stated, Madam Speaker, this request was made and approved pursuant to Section 11.5 of the Public Management and Finance Act 2020. Madam Speaker, as Minister for Health and Wellness, I thank you for allowing me the opportunity to bring to the attention of this Honourable Parliament the details of the appropriation changes approved by Cabinet of the Ministry of Health and Wellness in accordance to Section 11.5 
of the Public Management and Finance Act 2020 during the 2023 financial year. Madam Speaker, the Ministry had two Section 11, five requests and two Section 12 requests. They are as follows. Supplementary funding under 11.5 of $9 million for NGS 55. Tertiary med medical care at various local and overseas institutions. Madam Speaker, Cabinet approved supplementary funding under 11.5 of the Public Management and Finance Act in the amount of $9 million in July of 2023. This funding was to supplement additional expenses incurred under NGS 55 output, which covered medical care for indigents, seafarers and veterans with local and tertiary care. This continues to be a challenge to fund as there is a high demand for these services. The Ministry received an initial budget allocation for 2023 financial year in the amount of CI $21,593,371, which was insufficient to meet the demands. Number two, supplementary funding 11.5 of 4,400,000 for HEA2 medical care for indigents. Additionally, Madam Speaker, the Ministry received supplementary funding under Section 11.5 of the Public Management and Finance Act in the amount of 4,400,000 in July 2023. This funding was, was to supplement additional expenses incurred under HEA2 output, which covers medical care for indigents and is supplied by the Health Services Authority. This output continues to be a challenge to fund as there is high demand for these services. The Ministry received the initial budget allocation for the 2023 financial year in the amount of 12 million, which was insufficient to meet the demands. Number three, supplementary funding under Section 12 of 21 million 826 for NGS 55 tertiary, tertiary medical care at various local and overseas institutions. Madam Speaker, Speaker, currently the amount of 21826 is being sought under Section 12 of the PF, PMFA to cover projected expenditures to the end of the fiscal year 2023 for NGS 55 tertiary medical care at various local and overseas institutions. Number four, supplementary funding under Section 12 of 9,368,000 for HEA2 medical care for indigents. Finally, Madam Speaker, the amount of 9,368 is being sought under Section 12 of the PMFA to cover projected expenditures to the end of the fiscal year 2023 for HEA2 medical care of indigents which is serviced by the Health Services Authority. Again, the allocated budget is insufficient to cover the demands of this output. A total approximately CI 5 million is collected via a segregated insurance fund to offset, some of the ins to offset some of the expenditures incurred by indigents. Madam Speaker, the funding for these programs continues to be inadequate to meet the growing number of indigents and escalating costs of health care. But the Ministry continues to review and explore solutions, collaborating as well, and I'll put that in with other ministries, to explore solutions for the demands being experienced by these outputs and seeks to implement measures which may, which may help to better manage these costs. More will be forthcoming in this regard, Madam Speaker, in the very near future. Finally, my last submission for the importance of delivery to this Honourable House is a final statement of updates from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Again, thank you, Madam Speaker, for this opportunity. It has been a very busy time for me and my team, Madam Speaker, as there have been numerous initiatives that we have undertaken many of which are bearing, bearing fruit. 
I would like to con concentrate my remarks, Madam Speaker, on five key topics that I believe are of interest and importance to our people. Number one, STEPS 2023 National Health Survey. I will begin, Madam Speaker, with the much anticipated update on the STEPS, Steps 2023 National Health Survey. As you may remember, Madam Speaker, the Cayman Islands has very limited data to determine the national prevalence for key non-communicable diseases or their risk factors. Given my team's commitment to make a data-driven approach to decision-making, this project became one of our priorities over a year ago, especially in the light of the fact that this survey had not been undertaken since 2012. I am pleased to report, Madam Speaker, that after 10 months of planning, 13 weeks in the field across all three of our islands, and with the assistance of 37 numerators, 24 nurses, and five supervisors, all of which was managed by a team of four persons from my ministerial team, we were able to engage over 1,900 participants for step one of the survey, which consisted of the questionnaire that asked participants about their lifestyle and behavior. Over 1,700 participants for step two, which was made up of in-home physical measure measurements, including height, weight, hip, and waist circumference. And over 1,000 participants for step three, the finger prick blood measurement conducted by a nurse to measure blood glucose and cholesterol. These numbers, Madam Speaker, mean that we have nationally, we have nationally representative data on the risk factors for non-communicable diseases in the Cayman Islands. This data, Madam Speaker, will be invaluable in planning public health interventions and services for the future. I would like to, to not own, I would I would like to not only I would like to thank not only those who made this happen, whether behind the scenes or in the community, but also those who were randomly chosen to participate and who agreed to be part of this. Thank you. You have done your country a great service. I look forward, Madam Speaker, to sharing the results of this survey in this honorable house and with the people of the Cayman Islands during the, sec the second quarter of next year. Number two, Pharmacy Bill 2023 public consultation. Next, Madam Speaker, I am very pleased to announce that the public consultation for the Pharmacy Bill 2023 will begin on September 29th. Many people are not aware, Madam Speaker, that we are still operating under the Pharmacy Act 1979, a piece of legislation which is over 40 years old. The Pharmacy Bill 2023 will repeal and replace the Pharmacy Act 1979 and the Pharmacy Poisons and Restricted Pharmaceuticals Regulations 2017 revision. The new bill will facilitate the monitoring and regulation of the pharmacy practice and will help to introduce international best practices into our local practice. It is important, Madam Speaker, to stress that this bill is not only important for pharmacists and pharmacy technicians, every resident in the Cayman Islands will be impacted by this bill. For example, Madam Speaker, did you know that at present there is no requirement for medicine leaflets or the instructions that come with your medication that provides you with important information about the medication that you're about to take to be provided in English? Madam Speaker, when it comes to empowering our people and having them take charge of their health and wellness, we have to ensure that basic gaps, such as giving them information in a language that can be read and understood are enclosed. This is but one example of what the new proposed bill is trying to address and how it's looking to ensure better quality, safety, and efficacy of medicines. 
I would encourage all of our people to engage with the public consultation process. Learn about this bill and ask questions and make suggestions as well. Your feedback is important to us. More details on public consultation process will be released shortly. Three, I would like to turn my attention now, Madam Speaker, to some very good news which will strengthen our local healthcare system, and that is the recent approved changes in Cayman's blood donor eligibility policy. As most may remember, Madam Speaker, our former eligibility policy excluded persons who lived in the United Kingdom for more than three months between 1980 and 2001 from donating blood locally due to bony, spongiform encephalopathy, as we commonly refer to as mad cow disease. An assessment of the current risk along with existing controls of blood donors allow many of countries to revisit their exclusionary policies and I am happy to report that Cayman has done the same. A clinical subgroup of the Health Services Authority considered the evidence before them and made the recommendation for the exclusion to be lifted. Our chief medical officer, who also engaged our other two main blood and blood products users on island, mainly Health City and Doctors Hospital, was also in favor of the change. Thus, I am happy to report our blood donor eligibility criteria has been updated and has been put into effect with the Cayman Islands Blood Bank effective immediately. This change, Madam Speaker, will significantly increase our local blood donor pool, which in turn will reduce our dependency on importing blood from the U.S. and strengthen our resilience, especially in times of disasters. This is a significant win for our nation, and I thank those residents who have been keen in being able to assist our community with this gift of life. Number four, Ponciana update. Lastly, Madam Speaker, I want to touch on Ponciana Rehabilitation Center. Formerly the Ponciana Mental Health Facility, name change being approved by cabinet in August of 2023, in which I know the public and members of this honorable house have great interests. My team has received the following update from the project management team at Public Works Department on this status of completion of the center. And I quote, despite the best efforts to hand over the facility as originally expected by end September, the final inspection phase has proven to be more time consuming than anticipated. The Public Works Department project management team continues to work collaboratively with the Department of Planning to complete all final inspections to bring the project to successful fruition and handover, end quote. While my ministry awaits the handover of the facility, I am happy to report that a significant of work is being taken place behind the scenes as our center's director has hit the ground running. Since taking up office in July, Ponciana's director has been assessing the local mental health needs and gaps, reviewing and assessing the needs of patients currently housed abroad, gaining a better understanding of Cayman's mental health landscape, and creating the operational framework for Ponciana. The director has also met and started engaging the Mental Health Commission, and is and is in the process of hosting a series of stakeholder meetings with service providers, Cayman Islands government partners, NPOs as well as individuals, families and advocates. As part of the preparation to return residents to the Cayman Islands, the director recently visited the resident at the facility in Jamaica and conducted a brief assessment of their level of functioning medical and social support needs to accommodate them at the Ponciana Rehabilitation Center. There are currently 13 Caymanian residents in Jamaica, nine males and four females. The relevant plans will be put in place for their return 
which will be on a phased basis in the upcoming year. Last but not least, number five, dengue outbreak. Madam Speaker, before wrapping up, I would like to bring to the public's attention that my ministry, the Public Health Department, and the Mosquito Research and Control Unit are working diligently and effectively to monitor the dengue outbreak in neighborhooding, neighborhooding nations within the region and in Central and South America. To be clear, we continue to investigate any cases of dengue-like illnesses that is reported to us here. There is currently no evidence of an outbreak of dengue fever in the Cayman Islands. All of the current confirmed cases of dengue on our islands identified this year are imported, meaning these were travelers infected before traveling to the Cayman Islands. In light of this, my ministry is working to provide some additional guidance aimed at residents traveling to places where mosquito-borne illnesses such as dengue, Zika, chikungunya, and malaria are, poised, are, po are posing a public health hazard in an effort to better safeguard our people wherever they may go. Finally, Madam Speaker, I would like to express my thanks to the team at the Ministry for their hard work and continued dedicated efforts to bring about the, need, the needed changes across various aspects of healthcare here in the Cayman Islands. Thank you, and that concludes the end of my submissions for today. Personal explanations. I have given leave to the Honorable Minister of Border Control and Labor to make a personal explanation. Madam Speaker, thank you so much. As a matter of courtesy, Madam Speaker, and respect to this honorable house, I will be submitting my resignation from the PAC government, and I will be delivering a copy to the acting governor today. Can I lay a copy of this on the table of this honorable house? Yes, you may, honorable member. Do you intend to speak further? Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the letter addressed to Her Excellency the Governor, Ms. Owen, a resignation from the PAC government. Your Excellency, it is with extreme regret that after much prayer and consideration, I hereby tender my resignation as minister in the PAC government effective immediately. Since being elected in 2009, never have I experienced such disorganization and lackluster leadership. I honestly crossed the floor in November 2021 in order to assist this government and to lend my experience. Further, it was an attempt to give the country some calm 
and assurances. In my opinion, the autocratic way and manner in which the Premier of this country leads his caucus leaves me much to be desired. It is my experience that it is, it is his way or no way. The Premier's failure to adequately engage and empower the civil service, his inability to keep his PAC group cohesive and focused, his inability to get the 2024-2025 budget completed in a timely and consul consultative manner, his inability to listen and his inability to show fairness to all of his caucus are untenable. In my respectful opinion, our country needs leadership that has its entire caucus support and, then, and one that our constituents can feel proud and inspired. The Premier must ensure a people-centered government and provide hope for our people during these challenging times. Please accept my assurances that in spite of this resignation, I am fully and deeply committed and remain passionate about serving my country as Member of Parliament, and I am willing to continue to serve faithfully in a similar capacity for the benefit of our country and beloved people. May God continue to bless these Cayman Islands. Madam Speaker, I want to assure the people of Bordentown East that my normal way of any major happenings, I would call a public meeting. Some of these things are emergency in nature, and I apologize, I was not able to come to you and ask for your honorable support. And I know, and I ask for your forgiveness. Madam Speaker, I want to thank my committee for their support and encouragement. I've searched my heart, and I'm confident that this is the right decision. I came over here with great intent. I came over here and immediately had a confidence vote to ensure that the government remained intact and that they had a chance to prove that they were the hope that the people wanted. I contribute. I'm not silent. The country needs the breath of fresh air. The most unlikely, the most unassuming John John. I am most disappointed of all the things that I thought that this government could have achieved putting a bunch of independence together is what the country at the time thought that they wanted. It is for the country to decide how we move forward in the next election, whether it is parties or independence. I've run as an independent twice now. So much we could have achieved, housing, cost of living, etc. This is nothing personal. It's always about country for me. I have some great friends on this side. There are some great people on this side. There are some people who are new to politics, but some who could mature in the position of premiership. And I say that with great respect. Madam Speaker, we have so much to do for our people, but it's taken a toll on everything, it's taken a toll on me, Madam Speaker. And I have to divorce myself from it. Madam Speaker, what happened last night was the final straw.
I just want to say that the civil service, they are people too. And they deserve respect as they not only do an awesome job, but they are Caymanians. If you start wrong, Madam Speaker, you will end wrong. This is not my first rodeo with this, and it's never easy. Our people want hope, and we need to inspire them to believe we are the right one for this time. Madam Speaker, I prayed about this very hard. Some will be happy. Some will be sad. But I believe that God is in our midst. As I said, I've searched my heart. I believe this is the right decision to move this country forward. The country deserves this breath of fresh air. I thank you for your time. I thank you for allowing me to make this contribution. God bless these Cayman Islands. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker. Elected member for West Bay West. As the father of this house, may I ask for a suspension? I think matters at hand dictate a suspension. Can I get uh, Honorable members, we will suspend this honorable house for a few moments.